it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. It's my first time in an American forest by Emily Blue 242. Part 1. To hell with this shit, seriously. A few years ago, I, Welsh born and raised, ended up sharing a university accommodation with Cassie, an American who had for some reason decided to attend Aberyst with university. I'll spare you our long and colourful history along the path to becoming best friends. Suffice it to say, Cassie and I are pretty tight. Even now, years after leaving uni and despite being on different sides of the Atlantic, we're still practically sisters. So when she invited me and my fiancé Jim to spend a week indulging in drunken shenanigans in a cabin in the middle of nowhere, well, who am I to say no? Cassie met us at the airport. She even had a board with our names on it. Blue and Jones. Oh, we almost sounded professional. After there, she whisked us out to meet a group of her friends. Her brother Kit, her girlfriend Rice, Alex, Jay, Craig, Curtis, and a pair of twins who looked like cheerleader stereotypes brought to life. One was Ruby, and the other was Topaz. But I lost track of which was which before we even got into the cars. One started out with a camera, but since they were passing it back and forth, that didn't help. I drove a minivan. Curtis had what he called a truck. Cab up front, flatbed, that sort of thing. It was a pretty uneventful drive up. Mostly just catching up on things with Cassie. The boys, apart from Jim and Kit, were in the truck. I'm assuming a minivan wasn't quite manly enough for them. We were getting pretty far out from civilization, eventually turning into this narrow gravelly trail through some real dense forest. Like I said, I'm Welsh, so a one-track road in the middle of nowhere didn't upset me. What did upset me was when Curtis suddenly slammed the brakes on up ahead. I didn't see what had happened. I was in the middle of a hilarious anecdote when Rice suddenly stood on the brakes. We slid a little on the gravel before stopping. By the time I looked out through the front windscreen, the boys were already piling out of the truck, running around to the front. Naturally, we followed suit. Oh, man, we hit a deer, Jay called back. Mother f you came out of nowhere. The twins let out matching cries of horror, and I did the same. My first glimpse of American wildlife, and it was splashed all over the bonnet of Curtis's truck. Still, I went up to take a look with the others, and, well, it wasn't what I was expecting. I don't know how to describe what was wrong with the deer. There was just something about it which didn't look quite right, you know. Like something about the angle of the legs, or the shape of its antlers, or even just the way its eyes sat in its head. Well, I mentioned this, and though it was a second before I swear everyone had been looking just as unsettled as I felt, they all started laughing. What did I know about white-tailed deer, after all? Especially one which had been hit by a car. Of course it wouldn't look right. And besides, maybe it had a birth defect, or old injuries that hadn't set right. Maybe it had been slightly mutated by pollutants. Everyone had a reason for why I was wrong. Craig and Jay both know how to butcher a carcass, apparently. God, remind me again of what we're going into the woods with these people for, Jim whispered to me. And since we were on Cassie and Kit's private property, there was no reason to let Bambi lay by the side of the road and rot. Curtis's truck was, miraculously, still drivable, and so off we headed. The place was your typical quaint little log cabin, set dead centre in a circle of green lawn. Around the edge of the lawn was this circle of stones, only about a foot high, set two or three feet apart from each other. They looked almost like a boundary marker, and Kit said that's what they'd used them as when visiting the cabin as kids. Their grandfather let them play outside unsupervised all they liked, so as long as they stayed on the side of the house of the stones. I can see why, too. Even discounting the deer stop, it had taken us about two hours to drive out here, dense forest stretching away on every side. Thinking about a child wandering off into all that made me shiver. We took the rest of the day to settle in, and that evening the boys presented us with a fire pit. We were having a cookout, involving not just the barbecue stuff we brought with us, 
but also fresh venison steaks. Well, I couldn't stomach eating the deer. I don't even know if it's because of the wrongness with it, but it was just the memory of it being wrapped around Curtis's truck. Did have a few drinks, though. We were all getting along nicely, getting into the groove, when we heard it. Another party, somewhere off in the distance. Like I said, this is private land. Acres and acres of it. Anyone out here who isn't us is trespassing. Cassie was pissed off, but Kit was already pretty drunk, and he kicked right off. Suddenly he's got a rifle, and we're all marching into the woods towards this group of other people, with me just stumbling along in the back, clutching Jim's hand and praying my first visit to America doesn't end with me burying a dozen bodies in the frickin' woods. Luckily, sort of, we never found the people making the noise. It seemed to fade in and out. Not like it was being blown on the wind, but more like someone turning the volume knob on a radio or something. Eventually, Jay pointed out that all we were doing was getting ourselves lost in the woods, especially since by this point it was fully dark. We all agreed, and as we did, the sound stopped. Just like that, as if someone had finally switched the radio off altogether. We were all in a rough circle at this point, and I had ended up alone, slightly away from the others. I was sighing in relief at not having to cover for a multiple homicide, when I heard branches crackling in the trees behind me. It sounded huge, but before I could turn around, it was right there, right behind me, so close I could feel his breath on my neck, so close that if I reached out backwards I could touch it. I tried to call the others, but the smell of musty fur and carrion was so strong it came out as more of a wretch instead. That still got their attention. They turned to me, and despite the terror on their faces, nobody screamed. It's funny how it's possible to be so scared you just turn into a useless statue. My head was screaming for me to run, but my body had apparently decided to play that shit like I was facing a T-Rex. What is it? I managed to gasp eventually. No one answered at first. I don't think they really could. Finally, though, Cassie managed to grit out three words. Emily, don't look. Seriously? Or whatever it was, it reacted to my speaking. I felt movement behind me, and suddenly that hot, stinking breath was right by my ear. At the same time, I felt a gentle pressure on my shoulder, as if it was resting a paw or chin there. I expected it to bite me at any second. What I didn't expect was for it to start whispering to me. I don't remember anything it said. I think my brain just stopped functioning at that point, like it couldn't handle anything else and had just given up and gone to sleep. I felt drugged, useless. I just stood there and let the whispering wash over me, like I'd already given up. I don't know what would have happened next without Kit. The sludgy days I'd been in was blown apart by the loudest sound I'd ever heard, which I later realized was Kit shooting into the air. The whispering stopped, the hot breath receded, and suddenly everyone was screaming for me to run. Run, and whatever else you do, don't look back. I didn't look back. I did, however, look up, and that got me moving. It had antlers. Freaking antlers. I couldn't make out any features through the thick hair all over it, except its eyes. They were glowing, milky white, like twin moons hanging over me. And teeth. Oh, I definitely saw teeth. They all followed me. Kit and some of the other guys eventually caught up to me, then passed me. Behind me I heard the sound of something huge and heavy crashing through the trees, and then the shrieking of one of the twins. She tripped on a branch and twisted her ankle, because apparently she decided now was the time to take a leaf out of the horror movie handbook. Her sister was screaming after us, saying we had to stay and help. And then, distantly, they both started howling, howling like people being torn apart. The rest of us made it safely into the house, locking the door behind us. Do I feel bad about leaving the twins? Well, I'd love to tell you yes. But no, I didn't. Not even a bit. 
It's not like I twisted her leg, is it? It's not like they'd have come back for me or Jim. So why should I feel bad about it? Well, it all turned out to be a moot point anyway. We kept people on guard for the rest of the night, watching the edge of the woods. Well, obviously they do get reception out here, but it's seriously unreliable. Plus, I dropped my phone out there somewhere. Still, at 3am, Craig woke us all up. The twins are outside, he said. Well, no one believed him at first. Not after the screaming, but no. There they were, waiting at the door. They were smiling, and looked exactly as they had earlier in the evening. Now, they said the thing we saw was a costume, worn by some Mikey guy who apparently couldn't make it up this week. He could, however, make it up for one night to scare the shit out of us, apparently, before heading back to civilization without speaking to anyone else. Everyone accepted this without question and headed to bed. But it was light before I could get to sleep. So, am I nuts or what? The idea of one guy bringing himself up here, luring us into the woods, pulling that shit and then vanishing back to society in time for work just doesn't sit right with me. And then again, what's the alternative? Seriously, what? Evil ghost deer? Hulked out Bambi's dad? Oh, elementary, my dear Watson. I wanted to go home this morning, once I'd actually grabbed a few hours of sleep. But Cassie and Jim managed to talk me out of it. It doesn't help that the twins are supremely pissed off that we left them to die last night. Oh, they say they're not, but that doesn't stop them from staring at people when they're not looking. Caught them looking at me more than once already today. I turned around to see those totally blank expressions suddenly twisting into beaming fake smiles before they turn and walk away. If they're pissed off, I'd rather they just say so. Worse, I'm pretty sure they've got something similar cooked up for tonight. Jim keeps saying he can't hear anything, but while I've been writing this out, typing away on the laptop he told me not to bring, hoping to catch the barest smidgen of reception, I swear I've started hearing people calling my name out in the trees, just beyond the boundary ring. So, I suppose my question for you is this. Should I stay or should I go? Part 2. Apparently, I'm a total idiot. So, moving on. Well, something didn't sit right with me about that whole prank explanation. Well, Jim, well, Jim is one of those people you see in ghost story ass reddits talking about carbon monoxide and infrasound and stuff. So we bought it hook, line, and sinker. Cassie, though, felt the same way I did. And so did Kit. He's been having this friends with benefits thing with Ruby for years. And he woke up at some ungodly hour this morning to find her standing next to his side of the bed. Just smiling down at him. That'd be weird enough. But Curtis, currently in an actual relationship with Topaz, had the same thing happen to him. Curtis is taking Jim's approach to things, though. I still managed to talk Jim into coming out with me in the Tovies. We told the others we were going on an all-day hike, which they seemed to buy. I assume since we had plenty of daylight, it would be fine. We were trying to find the place where shit went down last night, and we managed it surprisingly quickly. I thought the run back to the cabin seemed shorter than the trek out because of the fear, but it turns out we've been led on such a twisty path that the place we saw Goat Mikey is actually unsettlingly close to the cabin. Didn't feel good to find that out. We poked through the bushes for a while, but there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary. We were just about to admit the Mikey story was true and head back, and to tell you the truth, I was weirdly disappointed. Ugh, I know things going bump in the woods is scary shit, but my life is freaking boring. Who hasn't idly wondered what it would be like to have an actual adventure somewhere? Not just getting wasted in the woods, but... Solving an honest-to-God mystery, like Sam and Dean with less plaid and angst. Oh, better boobs. So, yeah, as glad as it was that we were apparently safe, there was still that little bit of me that wished there was something just a bit more interesting going on. And then, that little bit of me got its wish. We'd actually started walking back when Kit called us over, 
pulling something out of the undergrowth. I had hoped it was my phone, but no, it was a digital camera. The one the twins were passing around yesterday. Kit held it out to us wordlessly, looking a bit sick. I saw what was wrong a second later. There was something splashed across it. Something that looked an awful lot like dried blood. Cassie took it and started flicking through the photos. Most of them were pictures from yesterday. Jim and I getting picked up, photos in the car, the fire pit, a selfie with both twins pulling fake scared faces, which they must have taken while we were following the voices. And that was it. The rest of the memory was just full of alternating photos of pitch black and overexposed white. Jim being Jim insisted on checking every single frame in my new detail. We were trying to shepherd him back to the house when Cassie stopped us, holding a finger to her lips. When Kit tried asking her what was wrong, she punched him in the shoulder, shushing him. Kit was carrying his rifle again, which made this seem like a bad idea to me. We all heard it then. Someone crying. Just this real broken-hearted sobbing, off in the distance somewhere. It was definitely female. I couldn't even guess at how old they were. We were all looking at each other now, and my skin had started prickling. There was something about the noise I didn't like, almost like it was echoing too much. It was really hard to tell where it was coming from. Kit called out to whoever it was, but the sobbing continued without changing. If we could hear them crying, then they must have been able to hear us talking, let alone Kit's yelling. But there was no response at all. After shouting a few more times, Kit turned to Jim, who nodded. I didn't get what was going on for a second, until Jim turned to me and told me they were going to try and find whoever it was, to see if they needed help. You can bet I wasn't best pleased with that notion. As much as I wanted some adventure, that adventure was me being kidnapped by the king of the forest and getting rescued by my motley crew of friends, or something. No, no not my husband-to-be getting mauled by some crybaby woodland bit. I asked him not to go, but then he made an annoyingly good point. What if it was some poor lost hiker, and she'd die because I was paranoid about ghosts? Right, fine, fair enough. Off they went. Cassie and I stayed where we were, Cassie pulling out a monster of a handgun which I didn't even know she was carrying. Well, it was a bright day, but in the middle of the forest they disappeared from view so quickly it sent another chill down my spine. They had a point about the lost hiker idea. Oh, it must be so easy to get lost out here. And that was when the whispering started. Right behind us in the trees, just this barely audible whispering. I thought it was the wind at first. Then I had a dunked in cold water moment when I realized that, though I couldn't make out any other words, I could definitely hear my name being dropped in there. I asked Cassie. And while she could hear the whispering, she couldn't make out anything clearly. There was something about hearing my name in there. Oh, I don't know. It felt like I needed to check out what was happening. It sounds so stupid, especially since I've been thinking about how easy it would be to get lost in here. But still, well, it was like a compulsion. So I told Cassie to stay where she was, to wait for me and the boys, and to cover me with her hand cannon as much as possible. She didn't like it, but I promised not to go too far, and off I went, following the voice as best I could. I'd barely gone ten steps when it stopped, and that's when I realized how quiet the forest was. And I spent plenty of time outdoors. I know that when people say the woods are silent, they just mean there are no sounds of humanity. Other than that, there's plenty going on. Birds, critters in the distance, water, wind. But there was nothing, just this really oppressive silence. You know what that reminded me of? Back home we've got this haunted chapel. When you walk in there's the same deadly silence. So heavy it seems to absorb all other sounds. But at the same time you feel the potential for something to happen. The feeling of eyes on you. The feeling of something waiting. That's what it felt like out there. Like a hell breath before. Well, before. I quickly retraced my steps. Cassie was gone. 
Like I said, the place was oppressively quiet. I wasn't even ten feet away, and I should have heard her moving. And she was just gone. But it was like I couldn't bear to raise my voice. It felt wrong breaking that silence. The sound of the guys, the sobbing, that was all gone too. It was so oppressive, it was like I could feel it as a pressure on my skin. I finally got a response, just not the one I was hoping for. It was the click whine of a digital camera. No flash, just the sound. Almost like whoever was taking the photo was right beside me. Hey, who's there? I yelled, managing to sound angry rather than scared. Which was a feat, trust me, because I was freaking terrified. Have you ever sat there in a really quiet house with the TV on standby? and realize you can hear the TV making an almost sub-audible whining noise. It's less a noise, more a pressure on your eardrums, something you sort of feel in your back teeth. What I got in response was like that. Only then it started getting louder and driving in deeper. First tinnitus, then a fire alarm, then so loud I could feel the pressure gripping my head like a vice. So much pressure it felt like my skull was going to collapse inward. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't even think. And there was just the noise. And then it stopped. Like someone had flicked a switch. Gone. Just like that. I was kneeling in the leaf litter. Still alone. Blood dripping from my ears and nose. And the oppressive silence was back. And while I was recovering, I swear I heard one of the twins whisper my name nearby. And then a giggle, and then... Silence. Blessed fucking silence. I nearly peed myself a second later when I heard someone crashing towards me through the trees, but luckily it was just the boys. They said they couldn't find anything out there, but the sobbing had stopped suddenly and then the trees had started rustling like someone seriously fast was skirting around them. They'd been running back to Cassie and me when the sound had hit. Yeah, they heard that shit too. They weren't bleeding, which to me suggests I was closer to the epicenter of whatever it was. It was still bad enough that it dropped them, though. We were just starting to freak out about Cassie when she stepped back into sight, smiling like nothing had happened. We asked her if she'd heard the whistling stuff, too, and she said she hadn't. She thought she'd heard someone calling her name after I'd left her and she followed it, but she hadn't heard anything else. Honestly, though, Something about the way she said this was... off. I think she's hiding something. I'm pretty sure she's in shock, like there's something not quite right in the way she's talking or moving. I think she saw something, and it scared her so badly she's dissociating. Or something like that. Well, I'm an office worker, not a psychologist. Anyway, we headed back, thoroughly creeped out. And then, to add the cherry of creepiness on top of the shit Sunday that was today, I swear we were only gone for two, maybe three hours. No more than three. I put money on it. Hell, I'd bet my freaking house on it. But everyone else was convinced they hadn't seen us for at least six hours. The worst bit is, I checked my watch. And they were right. I don't remember looking at it when we were out in the forest, so I can't be certain, but... No. Screw it, I am certain. There's no way in hell we were in the woods for six hours. No way. We somehow lost time. Jim and I said goodnight to the others, claiming jet lag and wanting a night in together. To be honest, though, we just couldn't process what was going on. At least I can't. Jim's still trying to formulate some rational explanation for this shit. I love the man, but... Gee, He's insisting we stay one more day, in case this is all one big misunderstanding. The rational part of my brain is telling me to believe him. I mean, shit like this doesn't happen. It just doesn't. Oh, you're probably screaming at me to leave, but I think if I did, I'd have to leave Jim. If he left now, he'd be admitting there was something out there that he can't explain. He won't go until he's proven right. Well, I'm telling you one thing, though. One more incident, and I'm throwing the fool over my shoulder and sprinting back to civilization. Wish me luck. Part 3 
This is me going the fuck home. And the immortal words of Florence Fishburne. Fuck this trip. Those coyotes kept going all night last night, and on top of that they were calling my name again, whoever they may be. I noticed it only happened when Jim managed to fall asleep. I woke him up the first few times, asking him if he'd heard it too, but I realised pretty quickly there was no point. Every time Jim woke up, it turned back into wordless, yammering screams. Oh, bless Jim. He wouldn't say anything about it. He tried to pretend he didn't mind, but I could tell it was irritating him. So I just lay there awake instead, listening to those drawn-out, yowling shrieks calling my name. At one point I said, fuck it, and I went to take a look at what was going on. I peeked out the window, fully expecting to see something awful. But the screaming stopped right away. I thought that meant something, but then I heard the front door quietly close. Cassie and the twins had gone outside. They must have scared whatever was out there away. I leaned in close to the glass and watched them. They walked in a line together to the very edge of the tree line, stopping just on our side of the stone circle. They held their arms up, like they were reaching out to something just out of sight, in the shadows under the trees. I couldn't make anything out. But then, it moved. I stepped back quickly, gulping down a scream, slapping my hand over my mouth so hard it's a wonder I didn't bust my lip. I considered waking Jim again, but decided against it and went back to the window. Now that the thing had come forward, I relaxed a little. It looked like it might have been a stag, but a big one. And as has been pointed out, I'm not an expert on American wildlife. It wasn't a moose, and that's the best I can tell you. Whatever it was, though, it didn't seem to mind the girls trying to touch it. I finally got some sleep after that, since it had actually gone quiet. In the morning, I went out to check the place I'd seen the deer thing, hoping to get a look at the prints it had left, maybe get an idea of how big it had actually been. No luck, though, since everything was overrun with canine prints. Pretty big ones, too. Jim, for some reason, thought running out behind me and picking me up was a good idea at that point. He dropped me quickly enough when I twisted around and tried to bite him in the face. I can't even explain my thought process behind that one. Well, he'd scared me, and my instant reaction was to try and bite his face off. Hey, what the fuck, he said, and he was right to do so. I apologised for trying to maul him, and he apologised for scaring me, and then he asked me if I still wanted to leave. And, well, I said no. I don't know why, it just came out. Like, I know you guys are seriously worrying about this, so am I. But whenever I think of leaving, it just... Well, it's like I want to, and I don't want to at the same time. Like leaving now would be some stupid, hysterical reaction, you know. Oh, I don't know. That's what I felt this morning, anyway. Feeling a bit different right about now, though. I told Jim one more day, and he said that if that was the case, Kit and the boys would invite him out to shoot at cans, which I'm half certain means they're going hunting. But I'm not sure what the laws around that are, so... Shh. I asked him if he was sure. He just laughed and gave me a hug. Well, at least he'll be with Kit. And once they'd gone, Cassie came over and told me that we girls were going to take a walk down to the lake shore. Well, it's not much of a lake. I don't think it's even got a name. Well, Kit and Cassie have always just called it Lake Tovey. But it's big enough that it has a little island in the middle. A nice shingle beach and a little jetty. Very pretty. And with the day being sunny again... Yeah, very picturesque. Plus the walk through the woods seemed to clear my head a bit. I've always loved being out in the woods. And there was that silence again, though. No ducks on the lake, no fish breaking the surface, no birdsong, not even the whine of mosquitoes or gnats. Well, that last one was welcome, though. We were just about to step onto the shingle when Rice grabbed my arm, risking a good biting to do so, and asked me if I thought Cassie was all right. Did something happen on your walk yesterday? She said, looking so worried it pained me to lie to her. Her eyes are so dark I could see my reflection and see the fake smile that I quickly plastered on. No, I told her. Everything went fine. 
Why on earth would she think otherwise? Oh, because I woke up at about 3 a.m. And she was stood over the side of my bed, just smiling at me. Oh, shit. So I lied to Rice. Told her everything was fine. Would be fine, whatever. Oh, I think I tried to deny it to myself until then. Even when everyone was telling me not to. But as soon as she brought it up, that was it. I couldn't unsee it. Cassie was like the twins now. Not quite as bad as them. She was definitely acting more normal. But there was still that blank look in her eyes. Like even when she was looking at you, she wasn't really seeing you. The smile which was so fixed and toothy was more a case of them showing their teeth. And the fact that they were always watching someone with those blank eyes of theirs. They were just watching and watching. Usually me. But if Rice caught their attention, they'd turn it on her, too. How could I have told her what I was thinking? Oh, if she didn't believe me, she'd think I was insane. And if she did believe me, her heart would end up just as broken as mine is. More, maybe. I don't know if this is something we can fix. I hope it is. I really don't think it is, but I hope so. Uh, sunny as it was, the water was way too cold to swim in. Plus, I've got this thing about swimming in murky water at the best of times, which this is not. So we started skipping stones instead. And by we, I mean Rice and I. The twins just stood back, watching. Cassie, surprisingly enough, joined in after watching us for a few minutes. And it turned out to be quite fun. Rice looked happier now Cassie was getting involved. And Cass looked almost with it. It turns out I'm excellent at skipping stones. I do like winning things, but, of course, I didn't have long to enjoy it. Whatever it was, it came from that island. I didn't see it on there. I only noticed it when it slipped into the water. It was swimming towards us, leaving a wide V of water behind it. All I could really see of it was a smooth head covered in dark fur and a huge rack of antlers. Rice had noticed it too, and she smiled when she saw it. A really delighted sort of smile. Wow, is it a deer? She asked me, the not-wildlife expert. I looked to her to point out I wasn't the best person to ask, so I saw it hit her the same time it hit me. A wave of dread so strong it felt like nausea. Stomach cramps, the works. Her face twisted into a look of pure horror, and I could see the goose flesh raise along her neck, just as I felt all my hair standing on end. It was like I suddenly ran hot all over, before that was doused with an icy coldness. My heart climbed up into my throat. Everything in me was screaming for me to run. Run like fuck and don't stop until I reach the cabin. But all of my muscles had locked up. And to cap it all off, that's when I heard it again. The tinnitus. The whistle, whatever you want to call it. I knew what to expect, though that didn't help. Again, it shot up through the register, up and up, until it was like there was nothing left in the world. Just the tiny bit of me that was still me, adrift in this white-hot furnace of noise. I don't know how long it went on for. I came back to myself, lying curled up on the shale, hands clamped over my bleeding ears. As my hearing started to come back, I heard screaming and splashing. I looked around as I sat up, dimly realizing that Cassie and the twins were already on their feet, smiling down at me. Rice wasn't there, though. I twisted to look out over the lake, and whatever the dear thing was had gone. Rice, though, was about halfway between us and the island, screaming hysterically between coughing fits. I ran out onto the jetty, yelling for her to swim to me. I was convinced she was going to die, that something had already ripped her open, or else it would wait for her to almost reach me before dragging her under for good. Instead, hearing me seemed to calm her down, and she started swimming back in. I waited on the very end of the jetty to pull her out of the water at the earliest opportunity. I even let her hug me, even though she was soaked in bitterly cold water. Well, she had no idea what had happened. The noise had left her just as detached from everything as it had me. Only when she came back to herself, she realized she was underwater. Not just in the water, literally three feet or so beneath the surface. 
She'd sucked in a good lungful of lake water before she got out. Between that and the cold, I'm really worried about her. But I'm the only one who is, apparently. I helped her back to shore and the others were still just smiling, like nothing had happened. Well, I bitched them out for it, mainly because I don't want them to know I suspect them. As I helped Rice home, they trailed a few feet behind me the whole way, Cassie assuring me I was making a bigger deal about it than I needed to. We'd lost time again. I realised it when we got back, only a few hours this time. It was enough to upset Rice all over again, though. She's currently huddled next to the fire I built in the huge fireplace they've got in the main room, and she's been sobbing steadily since she got back. Nothing I've said can stop her. Cassie and the twins are just hanging around, watching us. Sometimes in the room with us, sometimes peering in through the freaking windows. And smiling. Always smiling. Well, this is it now. As soon as the guys get back, I'm going the fuck home. Of course, that's the other problem. The boys still haven't come back. Kit promised me they'd be back well before dark. There's no sign of them, though. No sign at all. Oh, please let Jim be okay. Please, if nothing else, if no one else, just let Jim please be okay. I can see someone coming back now. I'm going out to get the van started. I'm not waiting for daylight. Part 4 Something is very wrong with me. I don't know what just happened. I don't know where I've been. I'm so freaking scared right now. There's nothing I can do about it. I think there's something in me. And I don't know if I can fix it. I mean, it wasn't the boys. The ones I went running out to meet. No, it wasn't them. I know that much, even if I don't know who the fuck it was. I went running out to see them, to see if it was Jim. Fully intending to grab him and drag him aside and never let him go again. But when I got out there, whoever it was, they turned and started walking away. Only I couldn't just let them wander off. I couldn't. They needed to come inside. It wasn't safe. And that's what kept repeating in my head, like a compulsion. It's not safe. Save them. So I ran after them. Only they were walking far too quickly for how dark it was under the trees. And that's the last thing I remember. Well... That's a lie. I remember plenty. I remember swimming. I remember that although I was under the water, I didn't feel cold, and I could breathe just fine. I could see just fine, and I was fast, so fast. I remember flying. I remember the creaking of my wings, the flutter of the wind through my feathers. I remember the way the muscles of my shoulders worked to keep me aloft, the way I could see the fall of every sparrow. I remember running. I was so fast and graceful, and although I was scared of a lot of things, I was still powerful. I ran with my family, and together we were strong. I remember. I remember. I remember being hungry, and so hungry, this hunger beyond anything I've ever felt, like my stomach was twisting in on itself. But then when I ate, everything was a hundred times more delicious than anything I've ever tasted before. I drank. And though it was only river water, I could have kept drinking forever, just for the taste of it. And I, well, I had desires, as if I hadn't been with someone for years. And when I was with him, I came, I bit at him like a wild thing, and when I drew blood, he only laughed. I don't know where I was. I don't know who it was that I was with. It's just a series of disjointed memories all shuffled together. Pain and pleasure and sheer bloody freedom, all jumbled up so that none of it makes any sense now that I look at it. Like a dream. It went on forever, and it lasted no time at all. The next real memory I have is of stepping over one of the stones in the circle around the cabin. It's like I dropped back into myself. Poof, and there I was. I looked up, and Jim was sprinting towards me, yelling, and for a second... Jeez, for a second I pulled away from him. 
For a second he was a stranger running at me, shouting incomprehensible nonsense, and I was ready to attack him to defend myself. Then he got close enough for me to see his eyes, and it all clicked back in. He was asking me what had happened, what was wrong with me. I didn't know what he meant until I looked down, wondering why I suddenly felt so cold. Turns out I was stark, naked. Naked, but so covered in blood, mud, and clumps of fur that it was hard to tell. Every inch of me hurt. I was covered in cuts, bruises, scrapes, bites. I'd torn whole strips of skin off in some places. In total, I'd been gone for two nights and a day. Jim carried me inside straight away, put me in a hot bath, and cleaned off what he could, fending off the others' questions. He got out the first aid kit he took everywhere with him, and patched me up as best he could. He said I was in a state of shock, which I found funny. He said that was part of the shock. He also told me what had happened to him, why he was so late coming back. The boys had all been up in a tree hide, drinking, when they heard something. It sounded how he imagined a bear growling would sound, Jim said. It was right below them, moving around. It never came in sight, so they couldn't try taking a shot at it. Instead, they just stayed up there all night, trying to stay quiet as to not attract any undue attention. When they woke up, they found that Curtis had gone missing. No sign of him anywhere. No sign of a struggle. No one heard him leave in the night. He was there when they went to sleep, and gone when they woke up. They finally made it back that day, only to find I'd disappeared too. And Rice was hysterical by this point, and coughing steadily with a massive fever. Her swim apparently hadn't done her any favours, as I had feared. Kit volunteered to take her into town, to get her to the nearest doctor. Of course, I'd disappeared with the only set of keys to the minivan still in my bra, so God knows where they are now. So they'd taken Curtis's truck instead. Now even when Jim can get a signal, he says Kit isn't answering his phone. Oh, poor Jim, he's so worried. He's worried about me, and he's worried about them. He's worried about Curtis, and that the twins don't seem to care about their boys, and that Cassie doesn't seem to care about what's happening to her brother and girlfriend, just like she didn't seem to care when I was missing. He's worried about the fact that Craig and Jay, since their night in the tree hide, have also been standing around, smiling but emotionless. Mostly I think he's worried because he still has hope we're going to live. He just doesn't know how to make that happen. I told him there's no hope. Not for any of us. I told him we should have left on that first day. But he shushed me. He seemed to think it was just hysteria, part of my shock, rather than something I know. I think he feels guilty, like it's his fault we've stayed too long. Oh, my poor boy. He's already spoken to Alex, the last of us who seems reasonably normal, and we're going to sneak off first thing in the morning. They think that maybe, if we start early and head through the trees to cut off a section of the road, we can be back in town by tomorrow night. I agreed with him, because it's what he needs, and because no matter what else is going on, I still love Jim. Right, we're going to leave before dawn. But, it's not going to work. Part 5 my first time in an American forest, and I'm all alone. Jeez, oh, oh, this is it. This is the end of it all. We left before dawn, just like we'd planned. Jim, Alex, and me, creeping out with whatever we could carry in rucksacks. We set off into the trees at an angle, so we could cut through the forest and meet up with the road further down. That way, if the others looked for us, they wouldn't catch us just by strolling down the driveway. It was hard going, harder than we expected. The roots and grass clumps seemed to be trying to grab our feet, to trip us up with every step. Branches grabbed at our hair and faces, or else snatched at any exposed skin, cutting us. It was like the forest itself was trying to keep us from leaving. Well, the man wouldn't admit this, of course. They just kept slogging on, forcing their way onwards, their hope driving them to reach the road. As it turned out, they were right, and I was wrong. 
Alex reached it first, stumbling through the last layer of grasping branches to topple face first down a banking onto the gravel. Jim climbed down more gracefully, then held out a hand to help me follow. As soon as we reached the road, the boys seemed a lot happier, practically skipping along. They thought we were safe. Whatever they thought was going on, I don't think either of them ever admitted it was something otherworldly. Not out loud, anyway. Surely it was over now. They were on a road, a man-made thing. They were clear and away. Never mind that we were still surrounded on all sides by miles and miles of wilderness. The road was a thin strip of oasis, a lighthouse of humanity. We were safe. We found Curtis's truck about an hour later, sitting abandoned in the middle of the road. The windscreen was shattered, giving the safety glass a smoky look. The nose was crumpled in almost to the point of hitting the engine, and there was blood splashed across it. Ah, they must have hit something, Alex said uneasily. Something pretty fucking big, Jim agreed. Both doors had been left hanging open. One dangled at an angle, like a broken wing, where it had been half ripped off, but there was no one in sight. And though two sets of scuffed footprints led away from the truck, they weren't following the road onwards. Rather, they were heading back into the tree. Alex headed off after the footprints without another word. Jim went to inspect the truck, so I followed him. There was blood splashed across the inside of the cab, too. Across the dashboard, the steering wheel, the seats, the windows. Blood. Lots of it. The passenger side window had been kicked out from the inside. The driver's side was starred and coated with the thickest layer of blood. You could almost hear the echo of their screams in the air. Then Alex started shrieking. Jim ran towards him, and even though he told me to stay where he was, I followed him. I couldn't let Jim out of my sight. I couldn't risk it. We ran, but as we did, something washed over us. Something louder and more immediate than Alex's horrific screaming. Ah, oh, the whistle. The tinnitus. There it was again, dropping us to our knees. This time, though, I didn't end up drifting alone. This time I could feel Jim's hand in mine. When the whistle left us, Jim pulled me to my feet and we kept going like nothing had happened. Alex had stopped screaming. We pushed through into a small clearing, only to find Alex in the jaws of a cougar. It dropped him and retreated when Jim ran forward, swinging a branch and bellowing a challenge. The cat pulled up at the edge of the trees and turned to bare its teeth at Jim. Then it turned to me, and our eyes met across the distance. It blinked slowly, then turned and loped off into the tree shadow. Jim had gone straight to Alex, though it was obvious it was hopeless. The cat had bitten clean through his spinal cord, right at the base of his skull. He wasn't the only one there, either. Jim noticed first and tried to keep me from seeing, but it was what I'd have expected anyway. Kit was there, too, sprawled out on the ground. The cougar had been at him, too. Maybe even more than one. There didn't seem to be a lot left. She's not here, Jim said after a while, sounding sick. Rice isn't here. Her footprints led in here, but then they just stopped. He was right about that. There was no sign of her. But I bet I could guess what she'd look like if I ever saw her again. Jim practically carried me back to the road. We both felt like there was something wrong, but it took us a while to realize just what it was. Yeah, we'd lost time again. It was far later than it should have been. And I think that was the point when Jim really started to panic. He told me to shut myself in the truck cab while he ran the rest of the way alone. Then he would have someone come back to get me. He seemed to think it was a great idea under the circumstances. But I thought it was about as awful as a plan could get. Oh, I begged him to stay with me. Literally begged him. And I think he thought I was scared for myself. He just didn't understand. He didn't understand at all. But I did. I knew if I let him go I'd never see him again. Not as we were then. And so I begged him to stay with me. But he didn't. I didn't see any point in waiting around or in spending a night in a drafty truck. 
I made my way home instead, and I wasn't exactly surprised to find that the way back was easier. The cabin was empty when I got there, completely deserted. I wasn't particularly surprised to find that either. Well, I'm still writing this because I want someone to know what's happened to us. I'm inside now, with all the doors locked, all the windows shuttered. Jim won't be coming back, I know it. And if the others do, I don't know what I'll do. Jeez, I don't want to know. I'm all alone, but I can hear things moving around outside. I'm so freaking scared, but probably not for the reasons you think. I'm not scared of what's out there getting in. I'm scared that eventually I want to open the door. Oh, God help me. Part 6. My first time in an American forest, and it's been wonderful. Can't take it anymore. I just can't. There are people out there. I think it's the girls. Maybe Craig and Jay too, but they're hanging back with the other things I can see in the trees. It's the girls. And it's him. They're calling me, still. All calling me, but I don't want to go. I don't. I want to be me. I want to still be me. More than anything, I just want to be me. Why can't I stay? Oh, I should have gone with Jim. When I was with Jim, I remembered home. My real home. He calls me. And I should go. No. God, it's getting so hard to think. It's not just coming from outside now. It's coming from inside, too. From inside my head. The tinnitus keeps sounding over and over and over. Each time it comes, it lasts longer. Each time is getting closer together. Like contractions. Is it a rebirth, then? A beginning from an ending? Or is it just an ending? The things outside, are they newborns or parasites? Shells? Are they really there at all? The thought has crossed my mind, you know, that maybe everything has just been in my head. Maybe I'm locked up somewhere, dribbling on myself and screaming about things circling me in the darkness. Maybe I never even left the UK. Or maybe the plane crashed and this is hell. Why can't I still be me? Why do I have to go? A sacrifice of myself to myself. I just want to go home and live my life the way I've always lived it. I wasn't exactly happy, but I was me. At least I had Jim. We could have been happy eventually. I know it. I know we could. But I won't open the door. I won't open the door. I won't open the door. I'm bleeding constantly now. Nose, ears, even my eyes. It will almost stop and then the tinnitus will come again and start the bleeding afresh. Every time it comes, I lose a little more of myself. I can feel it leaving me. I can't remember being a child anymore. I don't even remember how I met Cassie. I can still remember how I met Jim, though. I think I can, anyway. I met him on a night out, and a friend of a friend. They only ever called him James, but he told me his surname was Jones, and I laughed about it. I never called him anything but Jim afterwards. My Jim. I want people to know what happened. I want someone to know the truth, that I didn't just get lost or eaten by a wild animal. None of us did. Don't forget us, please. Remember us, because I don't know if we will. I won't open the door. I won't open the door. I will not open the door. I can't remember what university I went to. Christ, I can't even remember if I have any brothers or sisters or my parents' names. Why is it Jim that I remember? Is it some stupid love conquers all shit? Is it because he's the only person I brought with me from home? I don't think he can cross the stones. That's what they're there for. I see it now. To keep his attention away from here. That's all they can do. Once he's seen you, there's nothing you can do. What he wants, he takes. He can't cross, but the girls can. They're at the doors now, at the windows. There's more of them than there should be. The whistling, the tinnitus, it doesn't affect them. They just wait it out and then go on talking, telling me what I could be, telling me I've been chosen, telling me all I need to do is open the door. 
Open the door, Emily. Open the door. I won't. I won't. I won't. Why can't I stay? Please, please let me stay. I don't care if they have to kill me so long as I can die as myself. Please, that's all I want. I just want to still be me. I won't open the door. I won't. I won't. Jim's outside. I can see him now. He has him. I didn't think he'd make it away, but I hoped. Oh, I should have gone with him. God, I hoped. I don't know how much will be left of Jim before long. He hasn't stopped screaming. They're not hurting him, just holding him. Still, he's seeing things. Things a rational brain shouldn't be forced to see. I was marked. I see that now. I understand. This is all my fault. We came out here because of me, and then we followed the voices. It was me he came for. I don't know why, but that doesn't change things. Everything, everyone, my fault. I'm opening the door now. I'm sorry. It's all over now. Everything's okay. Jim's dead. I killed him. It was better this way, better for both of us. That I did it, I mean. Well, it was fast, and I was there for him. There was no pain, I made sure of it. I used my teeth. His blood is on the stones, and now the cabin is ours, too. I went out to speak to the ones outside. Cassie, Ruby, Topaz, Rice. Only that's not who they are anymore. Like I was Emily, but now I'm not. Now I am something more. Because I killed Jim. Back home I was nothing. Back home I worked in an office. Why should I have gone back there? Why should I have missed this? Home. <sighs> was it ever really home? God, please help me. Please, please help me. Well, I was wrong. People have ideas about things. They try to explain things as best they can. But people's brains are small, narrow, thin, frail. Human brains can't see everything. Because if they could, it would be too much to bear. Well, humans can't see everything, because if you could see everything, well, you wouldn't be human anymore. I can feel the trees growing. I can feel their roots. I can feel everything living in the forest like it's a part of me. I can feel Jim's life going back into the earth. And it's beautiful. As humans, everything is always so scary. We give names and stories to things we don't understand because it's by naming it that we understand it. No matter how scary it might be, if it has a name, it's manageable, it's understandable. You're scared of the woods and of what's in them. Well, I know, because I was too. Don't be. All we want to do is share this. Don't run. Come to us. Trust us. I know there'll be people who knew Emily who were worried. You don't need to be. It's okay now. It's all okay. I know now. This is a place where I'm safe and warm and loved. I'm home. And you could be too. Part 7 This is my life now, I guess. If you're looking for explanations, I'm not the one to give them to you. If you're looking for a name, we don't have one. Our people are old, old enough that we can remember a time when we were the only ones here. Although technically only the elders were the ones physically here back then. And we can all remember it once. We've, well, once whatever has happened to us has happened to us, I suppose. We can see all the way back to when the first trees grew here. And we can see and feel everything that happens here now. All at the same time. Yep. That's the sort of shit I have to put up with now. I think this will be the last time I can write anything. I'm still in and out at the minute. Sometimes I'm still just Emily. Well, mostly I'm sort of... Emily Plus, I suppose. Even then, I'm still me. Sort of, I think. It's really hard to say. I'm trying to explain how this works now I'm Emily Plus is basically impossible. I'll do the best I can, but you don't have words for most of it. Telling you in person would be difficult. 
Telling you in written words is... Well, I can't. And trust me when I say you don't want me telling you in person. Not now. Uh, the other reason for this being the last post is that... Electronics hurt like hell now. I think it's something to do with the frequencies they put out. It causes headaches, nausea, general feelings of achy unpleasantness. Basically not something I'm willing to put up with. Look, don't come out here. That's why I'm sitting through what feels like a wicked case of the flu to put down my last words for you all. I know what we said last time about coming out here. Just fucking ignore it. Kid and Cassie's family were concerned about the fact they hadn't heard anything from us, especially since they were due to be at their parents' house for some big welcome back from the woods barbecue by about midday yesterday. They came out here a few hours ago, a father and a couple of uncles and cousins. Cassie went up and tried to convince them to leave, but they'd seen Curtis's truck on the way in, and had found what was left of Kid and Alex. Well, they were pretty upset, understandably, and wanted us to leave with them before it was too late. Yeah. What surprised me was the first thing Cassie's dad did was grab her and yell in her face. You crossed the stones at night, didn't you? What were you thinking, Cassandra? Didn't Grandpa teach you anything? And Cassie just kept trying to get them to leave. It's almost like she cared. Maybe she even did. I don't remember anything from before I arrived here. But you never know. Maybe if you put my actual parents in front of me, I'd at least remember who they were. Well, we killed Cassie's family anyway. They point-blank refused to leave without her. And worse, they were talking about doing something. Given it was her great-grandfather who carved out a human safe space and put the stones up in the first place, well, we couldn't risk it. Especially not since her dad and uncles actually seemed to know what they were talking about. They looked surprised when most of us came out of the trees and started walking up to the cabin. They looked a bit more than surprised when the elders followed us over the ring of stones. Well, that's what complacency does for you. Never rely on hundred year old charms, folks. Especially when they can be cancelled out by something as simple as a gift of beloved blood. Well, I miss Jim, I do. He'd prefer it this way, though. He was never going to be allowed to leave, and given a choice between this and death, well, he was always a very rational man. According to the big man, some people just can't make the transition. They fight it so hard it rips their mind apart. They end up either dying right away or wandering the forest, neither one thing nor the other, completely insane. And he can tell who can make the transition and who can't. The only reason he took the twins is because he needed someone to watch us. And he didn't want us to panic and make a run for it that first night. We'll look after them, though. Probably won't be necessary for very long, but we will. I was touch and go, apparently. They called it a difficult birth afterwards. If it hadn't been for... Well, if I hadn't helped Jim, I mean, I probably would have ended up like the twins. Lucky for me, the big man was set on having me. Part of it was that I was due a reward for not eating the flesh of the elder Curtis had killed. Don't ask what happened to Curtis. Seriously, don't. But, weird as it sounds, the rest was that I'm Welsh. Strange, but true. I'm the first woman they've seen with the accent. And it turns out he's a fan. And then my little sojourn out there with him just sealed the deal. And so, my advice to you is this. If you do decide to go into the forest for some reason, fuck knows why, but it's your choice. Try not to kill anything, plants included. We don't like that. If you do have the overwhelming urge to kill something, then for fuck's sake make sure it looks like it's supposed to first. Why? I'll give you a little example on that one. Draw a deer from memory, then compare it to the real thing. Not so easy, is it? You really don't want to kill one of us. Not even without meaning to. Because when it comes to our people, we don't really go in for mercy. There's someone coming up the road now. So I think Cassie's dad got the word out that there was an issue. Probably called the police after finding the corpses. Sounds like it's going to be a case of retreat and observe. Which works for me. Gives me time to get to know the new family. Plus I... I'll need to take it easy for a while. 
I remember what I said. I remember us. Oh, and if you call me a goat man, I'll track you down and rip your fucking throat out. My sister disappeared into the forest last year, and I'm going to find out what happened if it kills me. Part 1 My little sister Emily was always more adventurous than I was. She's four years younger than me, and even when we were kids, she'd be the one climbing to the top of the tallest trees, wading through dark tunnels to follow streams, balancing across pipes over rushing water, or trying to catch sheep up on the common. Always laughing while I stood behind or below her, shouting for her to stop, come back, that she was going to hurt herself. Well, that's just how things were. Em, the daredevil, me desperately trying to keep up, borderline feral Emily, and stick in the mud Anna. Well, I never minded. She was my baby sister. It was my job to look after her, and I loved her. Last well, summer she announced she and her fiancé Jim were heading off to America with some friends she'd met in university. They were going to stay at some isolated cabin in the middle of the wilderness. A big gang of them getting wasted and doing crazy shit literally hours away from anyone who could help. As you might imagine, I was not best pleased. Well, I could get some time off. Come out there with you, I said, keeping my voice as light as possible. She just laughed. And we're going to be drinking and hanging out in the woods with a load of strangers, she said, in that lovingly mocking way that she had. You'd hate it. And she was right. There's no way I could realistically push the subject, and if she worked out the real reason I was suggesting, she'd see me as exactly the sort of overprotective paranoiac I'd always tried to deny being. And so I didn't go. I told myself I was making a fuss out of nothing anyway. Jim was a sensible guy. She was an adult. going to be fine. I mean, bad things only happen to other people, right? When word came through that she was missing, my parents didn't seem too concerned at first. I don't mean that in a bad way, they just felt the same way I did. But bad things don't happen to us, because, well, we're us. You hear about people vanishing in the news, but it doesn't happen to anyone you know. Well, we boarded the Heathrow to Bangor main flight, fully expecting her to have been found by the time we landed. Then we could all scream at her, have a holiday and come home. When the police met us at the airport, that changed. It wasn't only Emily missing or even just her and Jim. Everyone she was with had vanished. Almost a dozen twenty-somethings had driven out into the woods one day, and that was that, just gone. We all went out to the cabin, using it as a base for our search, all the families together. Oh, it was eerie. It reminded me of the Marie Celeste, or that Elon Moore lighthouse thing. Cupboards full of food, all their stuff laid out like they'd just popped out. But they were gone. Well, everyone was really enthusiastic at first, piling into the woods, confident a group that size couldn't be missing for very long. Well, we'd find them, of course we would. It would all be a story to laugh at one day. Well, week by week, people drifted away until finally everyone admitted defeat. They were just gone. Missing. Presumed dead, but honestly, who could say? Maybe they were in shallow graves, maybe they'd been kidnapped. Maybe they'd been abducted by freaking aliens. The point was, nobody knew and nobody seemed to want to know. Not by then. Uh, by then, everyone just wanted to move on as best they could. I was livid, but what could I do? The cabin belonged to Emily's friend's family and it was private property. Once we were told to leave, that was it. We flew home without her. It broke my heart. She was my baby sister. I hadn't been there to protect her. I was expected just to give up? Oh, fuck that. I always intended on going back, but what happened last week sealed the deal. While looking through a box of Emily's stuff, I found a notebook. And on the last page, she'd scribbled the login details for a website she used. Read it among them. Or well, this account. And then I read her posts. I can't tell if something unimaginably awful happened to her, or if she just had a complete psychotic break. I'd write it all off as insanity if it wasn't for my grandfather's old stories. How my however many great-grandfather before once helped out Gwynat Nud, king of Annan himself. Now this chap had a very attractive daughter who came up pregnant very soon after Gwyn's visit. Well, that and something grander always said about it. 
Kind knows kind. That's why I came to take a month off work, book a flight out to America and hire a 4x4 four four to get me back out to the cabin. I had to stop in town to pick up some essentials on the way, trying not to draw any attention to myself. Everything was going great until my month's worth of supplies exploded out of the bags as I crossed the postage stamp car park. I was hastily lobbing armfuls of stuff into the boot when I realized someone had stopped to help me. I looked up to thank him, flustered, and froze. He chuckled at the look on my face. Nice to see you again, Anna, he said, pleasantly enough. Oh, fuck, I said, because I knew the guy. I spent a lot of time with him last year. He was Bas Tovey, cousin of Cassie, Emily's best friend, who'd also gone missing. We'd gotten on quite well, and so yeah, he recognized me. We stood up, dumping the last of the groceries away, and I slammed the boot, trying to avoid meeting his eyes. He leaned against the back of the car, eyebrows raised, watching me. I glared back, determined not to speak first. Unfortunately, I have a will of cardboard. Look, it's not what you think. He snorted. Oh, well, you're just back for the nightlife, huh? Maybe I was coming to see you. Even though the last you knew I was still living in Nork. That's a point. Why are you here? He shrugged. Got a place in town in the spring. Just wanted to be uh, near them, you know. Oh, maybe that's why I'm here. I said quietly. He laughed again. Come. Let me give you some advice, Anna. He said, leaning in and lowering his voice. Go home. Going out to that place, especially alone, is suicide. My grandfather, people who live around here, they'd all tell you the same thing. <laughs> that forest isn't right. The last year was unusual, but my family have lost people out there practically once a generation since they've owned the damn place. People who've been out there, well, they've seen things. What sort of things? Well, people off in the distance who disappear when you get near them. Things that look like animals, but aren't. Things that look like people, but aren't. And that's not counting all the noises. But please, I'm begging you, go home. I shivered slightly, but shook my head. I can't, I said, meaning it. Look, I just can't do another Christmas without her. I just can't. He sighed, squeezing the bridge of his nose. Eventually, he said, Fine. Stay here, but don't go out to the cabin. You stay with me, and we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Deal? I agreed, making a great show of my reluctance, and he told me to wait with the car while he picked up a few things so I could follow him home. As soon as he was out of sight, I hopped in the jeep and headed straight out to the cabin. Ah, uh, so sue me. I didn't fly all the way out here to sit in his house listening to regurgitated ghost stories. I came out here to see if there's anything in that cabin to tell me what happened to my sister. The drive out was moderately difficult, but uneventful. Before too long, I was parked outside the cabin itself, which looked just as I remembered it, though with decidedly fewer people milling around. Once I switched the engine off, it was quiet out there. Not the eerie silence you might be imagining, just the peace and stillness of the forest. It felt sort of welcoming, actually. Like it was glad to see me back. I didn't try the house straight away, instead heading for the ring of stones separating the slightly overgrown lawn from the forest beyond. I never really looked at the stones before. They were rounded and seemed to be buried a little way into the ground, covered in lichens and moss. They also had some very faded marks on them, most of which I couldn't make out. The ones I could see were mostly Celtic-esque ruins, I think. I was so focused on them, I didn't notice the engine at first. When I eventually realized what I was hearing, they were practically the cabin. Too late to do anything. Not that there was much I could do anyway. Like I was going to floor it out of there and drive whoever it was off the road. That would go over really well with the police, I'm sure. It turned out it was just Bass. He stopped his pickup truck just behind my rental. Barely even spared me a glance as he hefted his own grocery bag and headed inside. I stared after him for a second, bewildered waiting for the yelling to start. I thought maybe he'd gone in to grab his gun or something. When I peeked through the door, though, he was just unpacking tins. He again barely looked at me as I went to stand next to him. 
So, uh, you're not angry? Oh, I'm pretty fucking angry, he said. But what good will yelling do? If I haul you back to town, you'll just end up back here as soon as my back's turned. Well, at least if I'm out here with you. He shrugged and went on unpacking. Well, um, thank you. You do everything I say exactly as I say. No hesitation, no argument, no stupid questions. I know stuff about this place you don't, so that's my deal. You want to stay out here? Fine. But you follow my rules, agreed. He held his hand out. I smiled and shook it, then handed him my phone, open to M's first post. You, um, should probably read this, I said, before leaving to get the rest of the stuff from the car. Crashed out on the sofa before I could hear what Bass thought about Emily's story. I guess thanks to jet lag. I jolted awake some time in the early hours, and for a second had no idea who I was, where I was, or why I was. And then it all came back to me. And with it, two realizations. One, Bass had given me a pillow and blanket as I'd slept. And two, something was shrieking outside. Specifically, I think it was shrieking my name. I was headed for the door before I could reconsider, half convinced I was going to barrel out there to a gang of inbred backwoods creeps, kick some ass, and thereby rescue Emily single-handed. Instead, as I reached for the door handle, a hand closed on my wrist. I let out a squeak before I realized it was just Bass. Look, go back to bed. Well, you can hear it too, can't you? Who are they? How do they know my name? Go back to bed. I stared him down. Well, tried to anyway. I failed. I pulled my hand free, briefly considered making a break for the back door, but instead struck my way back to the couch. I'd barely sat down before Bass wrenched open the door and bellowed something into the night. I don't know what the fuck he said. It wasn't English or Welsh, that's all I can say for sure. But it did the trick. It was a final trailing shriek, something like hysterical laughter, and then, nothing. First, an eerie dead silence. And then, the normal sounds of the night crept back in. Bass waited a moment, then shut and locked the door before heading back upstairs. I whispered his name, but he didn't pause and I didn't want to push him. Well, I didn't get much sleep after that. I'm actually starting to think I might have made a miscalculation. That being said, I came out here to find out the truth about what happened to Emily, and I'm not going home until I've done that. No matter what. Part 2 Well, I believe everything now, at least. No more of that, was it real or was it a breakdown, Agent Scully shit. Uh, I've just gone full Mulder. Gee. Bass has been point-blank refusing to discuss anything I've heard at night, as well as virtually keeping me on house arrest since we've been here. He did make French toast for breakfast this morning, though, so that's something. After the dishes were washed, I made my proposal for the day. He didn't even bother to reply, he just looked at me. I literally just want to take a walk in the woods, I said, trying to keep my voice light. It's not like I haven't been out there before. Yeah, but not alone. Uh, but I won't be alone, will I? I'll be with you. He shook his head, gesturing to my phone. You read the same thing I read, yeah. The whole thing. And yet you still came out here and decided you wanted to go poking around in the woods and chasing strange noises at night. Well, <laughs> when you put it like that, I huffed, waving this off. Look, I came out here to... Yeah, find out what really happened, yeah, whatever. He just stared at me for an unsettlingly long time. I saw it on his face when he gave in. Couldn't help grinning. Looking back, I hope it looked more grateful than smug, actually. Either way, we headed out early. He stopped me before I could cross the stones and asked me again if I was sure. When I said I was, he told me to kiss the fingers on my right hand then lay my hand flat on the stone for a few seconds. I did so without arguing or questioning. As promised, oh, I now had many, many new questions, and off we went. I'd like to tell you, 
I felt a sense of foreboding or creeping dread or something. But nope. Honestly, it started off as quite a pleasant stroll in the woods, if a bit cold. We'd been going for a while, and I thought to ask him how he seemed to know so much more about the place than his cousins. Well, me and Mikey, my brother, we've always been closer to our grandpa, he said after a bit of prodding. My uncle had a falling out with Grandpa when Kid and Cassie were still kids, so they only saw him occasionally growing up. My dad was always his favorite, I guess, and we grew up on the same street as him. He said what he knew about this place he learned from his father, who learned it from his father, and on and on. So, go on then. What's meant to be out here? Look, we're not meant to talk about it. Especially not when we're out here. Bass, come on. He looked at me inside. He said the Tovi who first built out here had a whole mess of kids. One day, one of his younger sons ended up going missing. Everyone was out searching for him. But this guy was on his own. When he found this, well, henge, I guess. Huge circle of standing stones. Not like the ones of the house. Real big ones. As he was standing there, wondering how he'd never known they were on his property. Something came out of the stones. What? Ah, oh, something. Man, I don't know. That's just how the story goes. Anyway, it came out and told the guy he was keeping the kid. But so long as they respected the land, he and the rest of his family could keep living out here. It would even keep them safe from anyone who posed a threat to them into the bargain. It even gave him ways of dealing with its family if they ever caused a problem. We just had to stick to the deal. Well, I'd imagine running over one of his mutant babies and eating its slow-roasted flesh probably wasn't sticking to the deal. Uh, probably not, no. Now, I'll admit, up until this point, I was still torn about believing any of it. I got even further from belief when, as if on cue, I started hearing a woman sobbing quietly in the bushes ahead of us, slightly off to the left. There was actually a tiny part of me, though, that was so convinced it was Emily I felt like my heart might blow right out of my ribs. But no. I know what Emily crying sounds like, and this wasn't it. Bass's hand closed on my elbow, painfully tight, and he yanked me to a halt. When I turned to look at him, he put a finger to his lips. His eyes had gone huge, practically bugging out of his head. Then, still shushing me, he gently but firmly tried to pull me back the way we'd come. At that point, I made a quick, admittedly fairly stupid decision. I pulled my arm free and sprinted off in the direction of the sobbing. Oh, don't ask me why I did it. I think the part of me that didn't believe thought he was trying to trick me into going back to town. You know the thing. Take me out in the woods, tell me a scary story, have someone make some timely spooky noises, then use it to convince me to leave. I thought if I could move quickly enough, I could catch his friend out. So... I was feeling pretty confident, and primed to start shouting, when I burst through the last few sets of branches to find a woman crouched down, facing away from me she sobbed so hard her whole body shook with the effort. The shouts dried up in my throat as I realized the woman was stark naked and absolutely filthy, with bones which were clearly visible through her skin. Her hair was a ragged, matted clump. Where her hands clasped her back, I could see her fingernails were black and about two inches long, tapering to a point. Honestly, my first thought that we'd stumbled across some escapee from some psych ward, living in the woods, keeping people as pets. That thought died pretty quickly. As soon as I saw her properly, she stopped sobbing and went utterly still. She stood up slowly. So slowly I could hear her joints crackle in the silence. And as I heard it... I realized it was suddenly silent. No critters, no birds, not even the wind in the trees. Just dead silence, except for my ragged breathing and the little click in my throat as I gulped. I started trying to back away, feeling colder than ever. Well, I knew I'd fucked up by then. That feeling of foreboding I'd been missing earlier hit me like a tsunami bringing with it the sort of strangling panic I hadn't felt since seeing that police escort waiting for us in the airport last year. Don't know if I made too much noise backing up or what, but she suddenly started jittering in place, 
like she was having a seizure. I froze again. And then... Anna! I broke out in goosebumps, because any doubt I'd had about her being human vanished when she spoke. Sometimes my dog sounds like he's trying to form actual words, and that's what this was like. It said my name, but it was like picking the relevant noises out of an animal call. It kept trying, each time sounding a little bit clearer. And then it started turning around. I was frozen to the spot, more likely to collapse, throw up, or both than make a run for it. Just then, strong arms closed around my ribs from behind and hauled me backwards. I yelled, but before I could start fighting, I heard Bass muttering, Oh, fuck. And then realized it was just him, that he'd come after me. He turned around a few feet away, set me down, and gripped my hand as we started sprinting back to the cabin. He didn't turn us around quite fast enough, though, so I still ended up getting the barest glimpse of his face. Now, obviously, I can't be sure. I was off my head with terror, and we were moving pretty quickly. But I think its face looks... wrong. Like a smeared oil painting. Anyway, we were sprinting along, far too fast for the conditions. My face is cut to ribbons from taking too many branches to it. But I couldn't hear any movement behind us, at least. I thought we might be in the clear. Only then I started hearing the ringing. Like a tuning fork had been struck. It was like tinnitus. I think Emily described it pretty well. The sort of sound you feel in your back teeth. Bass must have heard it too, because he picked up the pace, until the point I was practically flying along behind him like a kite. Well, the sound was growing, though. Not steadily. It faded in and out like a radio with rubbish reception for a while. But as we, mainly me, started getting worn out and slowing down... It started getting louder and more painful. I was pretty much spent, incapable of keeping going at that pace any longer. I gasped out Bass's name, trying to tell him to leave me and save himself. He stopped so suddenly my noodle legs sent me stumbling into his back. He didn't pause, but turned straight around, grabbed my right wrist and slapped my hand over my eyes, the hand I'd pressed to the stones earlier. And it just stopped immediately. I just stood there, gulping down air, waiting for something awful to happen. It didn't. Oh, Bass! Here. His giant manly paw slipped into my free left hand and squeezed reassuringly. And whatever you do, keep your eyes closed. Keep your hand over your eyes and don't react to anything. Oh, Bass, I'm freaking out. You'll be fine. He took my hand gently. Right, come on. How do you know we're going the right way? Just trust me. Come on. Well, I shuffled along after him, not seeing many other options. My hand was clamped so tightly over my face it's a wonder I didn't burst my eyeballs. That walk was most likely the worst thing I've ever done. Bass kept hold of my free hand, gripping tight enough to bruise. And seemed surprisingly confident in leading me. That started making me paranoid after a while, though. What if it wasn't actually him? What if something had killed him while my eyes had been closed, and now one of those smiling things was leading me off a cliff, or into a cave, or worse? And that's when I realized we were surrounded by voices. The thoughts I was having weren't actually my own thoughts. They were whispers in the air around me. So quiet and insidious, it felt like they were coming from inside my own head. Open your eyes, they said. At the same time, I realized I could feel things trailing lightly over my shoulders, my face plucking at the hand over my eyes. It could have been leaves, or cobwebs, or, well, something else. Open your eyes to be sure. Look at us, Anna. Open your eyes. Come see. And, God help me, I wanted to. I wanted to be sure it really was Bass holding my hand. I wanted to be sure we were still in the forest. I wanted to see what the fuck was touching me. 
I dug my nails into my face, pressed the heel of my hand into my eye socket, and bit back the whispers that were crying to get out. And that's when I heard it. The other voices had been distant, wispy, nebulous things, like the wind or a song stuck in your head. But this was recognizably human. This was a voice I knew as well as my own. It sounded surprised and delighted as it called my name. I knew who it was immediately. Emily. And I ripped my hand away from my eyes instantly, turning towards her voice. There was no one there. Bass and I were stood on the lawn of the cabin, and it was late afternoon, almost dark. Somehow, it was almost dark. When I looked harder at the trees, I thought I saw a few branches swaying lightly. But Bass squeezed my hand then, bringing my attention back to him. But it's true, I said in a very high-pitched voice. Isn't it? It's all true. Bass just snorted. Well, duh. Part 3 well, I started today ready to rip someone's face off. And I'm ending it pretty depressed, actually. Strike that. I started today bathed in terror sweat. See, I've uh, been having nightmares since last year, which is understandable, I think. Since I've been back out here, well, it's just gotten worse. And last night I took the biscuit. Oh, it was one of those horribly realistic ones, too. I woke up, went downstairs, and sat in front of the fire with Bass, sipping coffee. I noticed an especially long hair sticking out of my arm, which I thought was terribly embarrassing. So I tried to pluck it. Well, the hair came out, and out, and out, until I was holding about six inches of what I suddenly realized was stitching. And then my entire forearm split open lengthways. Blood gushed out onto the rug, one big sploosh, like a burst water balloon. And the flesh fell open like it was on hinges. I shrieked and tried forcing it closed, while Bass just watched impassively over his coffee mug. Then the skin of my hand slithered off like a loose glove and hit the coffee table with a sound I can only describe as a splot. That's when I realized there was no more blood coming out. I carefully braced my forearm, then let the flesh sag open again, just enough to get a look inside. Should have been bare bone in there, but it wasn't. It was a dog leg, somehow dry and perfectly white. The human flesh was a cover which had been stitched over the top. The human hand was really a glove, and underneath it was a fully intact dog limb. As I stared at it, horrified and bewildered, the split continued unravelling up my arm, until I woke up screaming hysterically and clutching at my shoulder. It took me a second to stop freaking out, during which I gouged a few chunks out of my arm. I just started to calm down when Bass kicked my door open and hurtled in, yelling questions and waving a rifle around in a manner I can only describe as worrying. I eventually got him settled down, and we spent the rest of the wee hours cutched up in my bed together, trying to ignore the continued shrieking outside. We got up around dawn, and that's when the shit hit the fan. See, um, the fact is that Emily's last post has been deleted, which is something I'd noticed and always found weird. Especially since the post before it, well, it seems pretty conclusive. Her laptop was one of the things left here, and when we went home, we took it with us. None of us could bear touching it in the meantime, but I got to thinking and fired off a text to my cousin Angie, giving her a vague outline of what I was looking for. Well, she found two things of interest as it happens. One appears to be Emily's actual last post, and it's reasonably short so I'll get that out of the way up front. If you're looking for explanations, I have none. If you're looking for a name, we don't have one. The people are old, old enough to remember a time when we were the only ones here. The elders share their knowledge. We see everything that was, is, and could be all at once. The trees show us. Be kind. Stay away. All the rest were word doc versions of the post she'd ended up uploading. But this was just dumped in the notepad thing. 
Only then there was a full word document, following the last published post. This one more or less included M's notes, but threw in a load of other stuff too. The Tobys coming out here and getting slaughtered en masse. The stones stopping working. Stuff that never happened. All written in a style as if someone was trying to imitate her. I had Angie check the date the post was last edited. It felt like I'd been sucker punched. It was dated after the initial search party had come out here. Bass made the mistake of joining me on the couch as I read through what Andrew just sent me, and I turned to him straight away. Are you the one that used Emily's laptop? He froze, refusing to look at me. And that was all the answer I needed, really. You knew about Emily's posts as far back as last year, I said slowly. You all did, didn't you? You knew exactly what had happened, and you knew it was the truth. And you let us all search around out there. Well, what could we have said? Fucking something, I don't know. What about the post, I mean, the last one? Well, Grandpa had Mikey write it, so... Well, to try and wrap it all up. Discredit it. Tell people to stay away. I don't know. I swear, I had nothing to do with that bit. And I... <laughs> You're a freaking liar, I spat and stormed off outside. For a second, I thought I was going to drive right back to town, and fuck everything, and just run. Next thing I know, I'm down by the nearest of the stones, with a pencil and paper, doing a rubbing of one of the symbols. Well, it did strike me as odd. I couldn't remember the moment I stopped wanting to get some space, and decided to finally put my GCSE geography skills to use instead. Then I got slightly distracted. I mean, again, some more. The symbol I was looking at was a Valknut, as in the old Norse mark meant to be sacred to Odin. Only about three inches away from it was a Celtic one. Triquetra, I think they're called. Sort of a circle triangle. Look, I'm not an expert in this. So anyway, I looked harder. It turns out they're all like it. At least all the ones I've checked are. Celtic stuff alongside Norse alongside a lot of stuff I don't recognize, all mixed in together. I'd been out there for hours when Bass came over to join me. I'd mostly forgotten about being pissed off at him by then, and pointed out the weirdness of this. We just shrugged. Oh, the stones were here before their house, he said. If people made them, it was well before our time. The first Tovey moved them so they made a boundary. It used to be spread out all over the land around here. Listen, Anna, I really didn't write that last post, but I'm the one that deleted it. Grandpa and Mike, they just wanted it to sound like some stupid story, so that's what they did. I kept thinking about it, and I just uh, didn't feel right, lying about all of it, especially after I met you. I thought she was entitled to her last words, and you, I couldn't tell you about it, but you were entitled to read them if you ever found them. I stood up, brushing lichen off my hands, and looked at him. He looked so forlorn, I just couldn't help myself. All right. You're absolved on account of having saved my ass multiple times already. Hard to hold a grudge under the circumstances. Hey, um, any other big revelations you want to revelate while we're at it? You still give me that look, and my heart dropped. Oh, jeez. What else? I want you to be honest about something. Not just with me, with yourself, too. Don't answer with what you think you should say. Actually think about it. Okay? Why are you so dead set against going back to town? I pulled a face, instantly wanting to snap something about Emily, but reluctantly did as he asked. I suppose, I'm, even with everything, I feel comfortable here, I said slowly. I felt like the words were being dredged up from way down deep. When I first got back here, I felt more like coming home than actually going home did last year. Plus, every time I seriously think about leaving, I get this, like, well, I want to say, feeling of superstitious dread. It's like how you feel bad if you smash a mirror or open an umbrella indoors. 
I know rationally, but nothing bad will happen to me back in town. It'll be safer than here, any road. But I still feel sick whenever I think about it. It's like I can always find something else I'd rather be doing. He'd been staring at me the whole time with this look I couldn't quite place. I realized what it was then. Pity. A sort of deflated pity. And I felt a chill go down my spine. Oh, he's in my head, isn't he? Bass nodded. Oh, I could always just throw you in the truck and drive away, he said, though we both knew it wouldn't be that easy. I swallowed, my throat suddenly very dry. Well, when do you think it... Probably the first time you crossed the stones. I noticed it last year before you left, but I wasn't trying so hard then. I didn't want to draw any more attention than it already had, especially after that diver vanished too. But, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had to look back over a period of your life and wonder how much of it was real? Had to run back over a year's worth of making decisions and thinking thoughts and just hopping along, and then try to figure out how much of it was you and how much of it was something other. Something which had wriggled into your mind without your noticing and gently but firmly steered you down a certain path. I let out a long breath, blinking back a sudden flood of tears and gave a rather soggy laugh. I'm fucked then, aren't I? Well, like I said, I could always toss you in the truck. He trailed off. Nothing more needing to be said. And whatever's out here had stopped Kit and Rice's escape. It had taken Jim and shepherded Emily back to the cabin. There's an awful lot of trees between here and civilization. And every single one could be hiding something behind it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bass said. Sounding like he meant it. I'd hoped to stop you in town. I should never have let you out of my sight. You moved up here to stop me doing this, didn't you? I said, the thought suddenly occurring to me. He nodded, looking slightly embarrassed. Oh, I had a few friends keeping an eye out for you too. I really am sorry. Don't be, I said, going up on tiptoes to give him a kiss on the cheek. I appreciate the effort. Now, well, it is what it is. And it's good to know in a way. There's a certain stress that goes with hope. I have to keep trying. I have to keep fighting. I can't give up no matter what. Accepting that you're fucked no matter what you do is strangely liberating. Besides which, I've got one thing going for me. One thing he can't take from me. I started writing this so people would know what happened to Emily and the others, and so that if I never came back, if something happened to me, there'd be something to show for it all. And I'm going to make good on that. I'll be here to the bitter end. Part 4 well, Last night I slept better than I have for a while. Well, that's because I'd made peace with my eventual horrible demise, or because Bass and I had decided to bed share some more. Well, I couldn't say. Probably a little of both. The dream I had this morning, though, well, at least it wasn't as awful as the dog-leg dream. In it, I was sat on a shingle beach, looking out over a small lake with an island in the center. A little boy was stood on a wooden jetty to my left, skipping stones. He turned to look at me as if he suddenly realized I was there. He beamed and came sprinting over to throw himself on me in a hug, babbling in a language I didn't understand. I got him by the shoulders and led him away from me, and barely managed to keep from hurling him down the beach when I got a good look at him. I can't remember why now, or any details about him, only that there was something subtly wrong about him, something other, and he had Emily's eyes. And that's when I heard the voice behind me, her voice. He says you have to come home, she said, and the boy nodded eagerly. I refused to turn around, but heard the shingle crunching as she walked up to kneel down beside me. She put her chin on my shoulder to whisper in my ear, and at the same time the boy turned to point out the little island, which had started to glow so brightly I could barely even look at it. You 
have to come home, Anna. I jolted awake at that point, elbowing Bass in the throat as I did so. He didn't seem bothered. Went straight back to sleep, actually. I pushed myself upright and sat there for a while, trying to get my breath back. That's when I realized it was quiet outside. For the first night since I've been here. Just quiet. No screaming or howling. But no eerie stillness either. Then, so suddenly I almost wet the bed. Something broke the quiet. I might not have spent a great deal of time around guns. But I've lived rurally enough to know what a gun sounds like. Someone was shooting outside. And the gunfire was quickly followed by desperate screams. Some very human screams. I tried shaking Bass awake, but he wasn't budging. I decided that was probably for the best, and then quickly dressed and headed outside. I didn't take the rifle with me, since I'd be more likely to break my jaw or my collarbone firing wildly at a raccoon or something. And yes, I know, I headed out into the forest alone and unarmed at night. My thoughts on the matter were that I was fucked no matter what, but that there were people out there who were still alive, who I might be able to help. I couldn't just sit in bed with my hands over my ears, could I? I scribbled a hasty note to Bass, grabbed a torch and headed out. Thankfully, I remembered to do the little rituals across the boundary, kissed my fingers, and patted the stone. Then I slipped out into the trees, turned the torch off, and listened. Surprising how far sound travels at night, even under the trees. I could hear a man's voice sobbing and cursing off to my right. Well, as disconcerting as that was, I still felt like I should try to help. I picked my way closer as quietly as I could, and in case it was one of those mimic things, I put my hand over the end of the torch. The intention was to make it duller, to keep it from giving me away. It actually just made the light all reddish and organic looking, it was generally as creepy as fuck. Anyway, it wasn't a mimic. It was just a young man, probably in his mid-twenties. He had a shaved head, was wearing a huge plaid shirt, and was sobbing into the rifle he clutched to his chest, whimpering gibberish to himself. Hello? I said softly, stepping out into view. I took a quick look around, but we seemed to be the only two there, at least for the moment. The rifle was up and pointed at my chest in an instant, the guy's tear-stained face suddenly warping into an angry grimace. Yeah, who the fuck are you? He screamed. I could barely move. Have you ever had a gun pointed at you? One you're pretty sure would leave you with a cartoon-sized hole through your torso? I crept outside that night ready to deal with supernatural horrors, but now there was some random hysteric holding a gun on me. So at the exact moment I realized that I might have made my peace with being kidnapped by some sort of wood spirit. But dying? Oh, not so much. Listen, I have a cabin back there, I said quickly, keeping my voice as steady as I could. I just heard something out here. I wanted to see if you were all right. We were hunting, he said. His eyes were jerking about all over the place, like he couldn't bear to look directly at anything. Me and the boys... I think it got them all. Oh, jeez, I think it got them all. With that, he went off into another screaming fit. Most of it was garbled gibberish, but I got enough to work out that he and his friends had decided to ignore all the local legends and come out to hunt and camp on Tovey Land anyway. Then he'd gone to see his friends being horribly murdered, well, at least by the sounds of it. The last thing he said, though, was perfectly clear. You're one of them. I can tell. Oh, shit. No. I, I have a cabin over there. You're not one of the frickin' Tovies, he snarled, and those rolling eyes had finally picked a spot to fix on. Me. Oh, great. He finished up with, I recognize your voice. You bish. You're that one that... Oh, God, Simon. Oh. What the hell have you done, Em? I thought, even as I hastily started trying to explain the situation. Lord knows what I would have said, mind you, especially since the guy was shrieking and wailing again by this point. He also brought up that rifle again, aiming it at my face this time, finger on the trigger. And then, he was gone. 
For a second I thought that's literally what had happened, that he'd just straight up vanished into thin air. The gun went off somewhere in there, and I felt chips of bark rain down on my head from where the branch above me exploded into shrapnel. But there was no sign of the guy. And then came the screaming. The noises he'd been making before had been horrible enough. The sounds of a man losing his grip on reality. But this was worse. This was high-pitched and rabbity, and slightly damp, like there was something blocking his airway. And then came the other sounds. The ripping, the grinding, the chewing. He hadn't disappeared. He was in the bushes behind where he'd just been standing. And something had pulled him in. Well, I might have stood there all night, praying not to be noticed if the chewing sounds hadn't stopped suddenly. The screams had turned into weak moans by now, and I heard something whisper, again in that gravelly dog yowl of a voice. Shh. A few seconds later it followed it up with, Anna. The last syllable rising into an ear-splitting shriek, like a cat being tortured. And under it, I could hear the guy, screaming his thick, gurgling death screams again. Well, that was enough for me. I clapped the hand I'd touched to the stones over my eyes, hurled the torch at whatever was making the noise, fuck knows why, and sprinted back towards the cabin as quickly as I could. At least I finally knew how Bass had gotten us home that first visit to the woods. The cabin glowed like a beacon as soon as the hand was over my eyes, so brightly I could actually make out the silhouettes of the trees between me and it. Something started crashing through the trees behind me as I went, and I started letting out these big, wimpy squeals, convinced there was no way I was going to be able to outrun whatever this was. But I did. I also caught my foot on one of the stones and went sprawling flat onto the grass, frog hopping the rest of the way to the cabin. To my relief, the lights were on. Bass must have been watching for me, since as soon as I crossed the stones, he was stood on the porch with his own rifle. What was all that? He yelled as I scrambled past him, not stopping until I'd practically crawled into the fireplace. Well, you had a load of guys from town on your land, apparently. I gasped out. Key word in that sentence is had. Bass quickly shut the door and locked it, coming to join me on the floor. You went out to see some townies? Where else was I going to go this time of night? Well, he opened his mouth to answer, looking down at the crumpled mess that was left of the note I'd left. The note including my dream about the lake and the island. I cocked my head. You thought I'd gone to the lake? The one that took the diver? The calm had started creeping over me by then, like a warm blanket. It seems being brain fart isn't all bad. We haven't been out at the lake since I've been here. Why? Oh, we're meant to avoid it, he said reluctantly. We can boat on the lake if we take some precautions. Ask permission and such. But no one goes out to the island. I smiled. Well, that's where we're going next. The Tovies keep a boathouse on the lake shore with a sweet little rowing boat and a kayak. Well, I loathe kayaks, so I was pretty glad when Bass started hauling the boat down the shingle. Bass wasn't glad about any of it. He was righteously pissed off as it happens. I can't blame him. He rowed us out there, finding a landing spot on the island. He looked apprehensively up at the bank as he hauled the oars in, making it blatantly clear he didn't want to do this in the least. Well, I didn't blame him, but in that moment I made my decision. Okay, I said, standing up and slinging the rucksack we'd brought over my shoulders before he could grab it. I underestimated the weight of it and almost ended up toppling backwards into the water, which slightly ruined the extremely competent wilderness explorer effect that I was going for, but huh, such is life. You stay here until this evening. If I'm not back by then, go back to the cabin for the night and head straight into town in the morning. What? He grabbed my arm as I started climbing out of the boat, almost dumping me in the water in the process. No, Anna. Look, we're... We aren't doing anything, I said, still trying to be all debonair in that, but the look on his face made me feel awful. I sat back down, 
taking his hands. Bass, listen. I don't know if I'm coming back from this. I can't know if this is a choice I'm making or if that's what they want me to do. But I have to do it. I can't explain it, but I do. I think it's why I came back here. But I'm not going to drag you up there, too. I want you to wait as long as it's safe. And if I don't come back, you're going to go home, call the police, and forget all about me, okay? Oh, he was not pleased. I started yelling about how the whole trip was just one big elaborate suicide attempt. How I was deliberately acting like the dumbass white woman in a horror movie. How I was so desperate for attention, I had to get it from a monster in the woods. I just sat there and let him rant away, because he clearly needed it. When he finally ran out of steam, I just smiled and said, Well, I'm still going, and you're still staying here. He swore loud enough that it echoed all across the lake. But he'd given in, I could tell. Because he knows, same as me, there's no easy way out here for me. And even if I physically make it back to town, well, it's going to get me one way or another. Might as well see what this island is all about before I go, right? Well, on impulse, I decided to kiss Bass before I handed the phone up. He's standing there now, looking adorably surprised. I might give him another one before I head off into the land where Toby's fear to tread. And, just in case, thanks for listening so far. It's given me something other than constant existential dread to focus on. Just remember, stay safe. Part 5 Where well, I lived... And I've got a lot to tell you. Because I'm in hospital and I've got nothing better to do. Well, just to let you know, things are about to get very, very weird. Anyway, so, I headed off into the little wood that covered the island. All hiking gear and rucksack, which contained a first aid kit, packed lunch and water bottle, chocolate bars oh, for energy, plus one of those brilliant tinfoil blankets they use to make people in shock look like roast chicken. The walk was pretty much perfect to begin with. Even ground, not too rocky. No dense underbrush or anything. There was a nice clear path. The surrounding trees kept the worst of the wind out, and the overhead cover let through enough sunlight to create that really nice dappled effect. Well, I don't own a watch, and Bass had my phone, so I didn't have any way of keeping track of time. Still, I'd taken a good look at the island as we paddled up, and I thought it'd take me maybe 20 minutes to walk the length of it. I also started counting off the seconds as I went, which wasn't perfect, but at least gave me an idea of how long I'd been out there. Around the third hour of walking in a straight line, I decided to take a break. I wasn't hungry enough for lunch yet. I felt surprisingly well rested, but I still felt like having a sit down and a snack in the sunshine. The sun was directly overhead at this point, which seemed to confirm my suspicions over how long I'd been going for. I could have walked a full lap of the lake itself in three hours. As I sat there, mulling this over and munching on a mounds bar, which it turns out is like a dark chocolate bounty, it made me feel quite homesick. I heard the flutter of wings above me. I looked up to see the first non-me living thing I'd seen on the island, which happened to be a very large raven. It peered down at me with beady eyes, head cocked to the side. Want some? I asked it, holding the bar up for it to see. It clacked its beak, which I took as a yes, so I broke off a little chunk and chucked it a few feet away. The raven flew down and gobbled it up. Since I wasn't exactly starving, and since it felt nice having something alive and reasonably normal around, I broke the rest of the bar into little pieces and tossed them over to it. Once it was all gone, I tucked the wrapper into a side pocket of my bag and took a swig of water. Well, all gone, little man, I said, showing it my empty hands. Hope you enjoyed it. The raven cocked its head at me, clacked its beak, and then said, in perfectly understandable human tones, Welcome home, Anna. And then it flew off down the path. Oh, cheers, you creepy little fuck, I called after it. I think I heard something laughing in the distance. Who knows at that point? I kept walking after that, counting out another three hours or so. This time I didn't have the benefit of the sun backing me up, 
It's still fixed overhead, not budging the whole time. That bright noonday light filtering down somehow made it feel even worse when I started finding the stones and bones. There were rocks lining the path at this point, similar to the markers at the cabin, though these looked older, more warm. The markings on them, on the other hand, looked so fresh they might have been done yesterday. It was easier to see what I'd noticed on the ones at the cabin here. Spirals, Valknuts, and Orkham all sat side by side with Norse runes and Triskelions, Triquetras, pentagrams, plus a whole lot of other pictograms and sigils I didn't recognize. These rocks looked like they might fall apart at any moment under the sheer mass of carvings and hanging from the trees above the stones were strings laden with all manner of things, from beads and feathers to what looked like human scalps, carved antlers and horns, pebbles with holes bored through them, figures woven from hair and fur and nails, sticks carved with symbols, oh, and bones, plenty of bones, everything from digits to long bones to skulls, from anything you can imagine. There are plenty of human skulls present too, most of these had also been carved. I would probably have been freaking out at this point, but again it was like a blanket of calm had been wrapped around me. Have you ever been in this sort of shock where you can feel panic and hysteria bubbling away just below the surface, but overlaying this is a veneer of perfect calm, keeping the hysteria locked tightly away? Well, it was like that. Like someone had wrapped one of those tinfoil shock blankets around my mind. My mind looked like a roast chicken. I was so busy inspecting one particularly interesting human skull, this one had multiple gold teeth, that I didn't notice I'd left the path, stepping over a boundary stone so I could look at the skull from the other side without touching it. I also didn't notice the sheer drop until I was already mid-air, though I'd have sworn the ground was perfectly solid a second before. I landed heavily on my hands and knees, the rucksack flying forwards to slam my face into the ground. Only it didn't hit the ground. I ended up headbutting another skull, which cracked under the force, driving shards of old bone into my forehead. I sat back with a whimpered cry, reaching up to pluck the splinters out, which is when I realized my hands had also been punctured here and there. Judging by the pain in my legs, they were in the same state. I slowly looked down. And then, I just as slowly got to my feet, swallowing down all the hysterical shrieks that were trying to come out. And it was a pit. Maybe quite a deep one, I don't know. By the time I got there, it had been filled with so many bones they formed a dense enough framework that I could walk across them. The pit stretched away into an impossible distance on either side of me, though the distance from me to the far bank was only about 40 feet. It was like standing in a river of bones. Just staring at the way my blood was dripping through the gaps between the bones. Except I heard a croak above my head. I looked up, Noticing the branches overhead here were more densely woven, and were all leafless, bleached, and dead. Sitting on this latticework was the raven. It cocked his head at me, and in an unsettlingly human voice it said, you should probably stick to the path. And it had a point. I started for the other side then, bones crunching and clicking beneath me, while overhead the branches rattled and rasped as the raven hopped along, keeping pace. I kept my gaze on the far bank. I was actually starting to relax a bit when I heard that voice from overhead again. Uh-oh. I was looking behind me, back to where my blood was still trickling. I looked too, wondering what the problem was. Then a section of the bones rose up slightly, right where my blood was. There was a second where nothing happened, before another section rose, this one slightly closer to me. I think the raven told me to run, but it needn't have bothered. I was away by that point. I hit the far bank and started scrambling up its sheer face, glad the earth was the right consistency for me to get my hands and feet into it, to clamber my way back to solid ground. I had my chest over the edge, when something grabbed both my ankles and tried to haul me back down. I clung on, kicking wildly, and felt something graze my calf. Then whatever it was let go, and I finally made it over the edge, rolling away until I fetched up against a tree, gasping for breath. The raven croaked and flew on. Once I had my breath back, 
I checked my leg, which had a slight graze on it, a few beads of blood here and there. My ankles ached, though, and there was a large chunk torn out of my trousers. I managed to limp on another hundred meters or so before I had to stop. I ate my lunch after a while, again sharing it with my creepy new friend. So, what's up ahead? I asked. The whole world, it said, before flying back off the way he'd come. Well, very fucking helpful, I yelled after it. From there, the ground started to rise, the trees thinning out. What had been a perfectly straight path now started to wind in a spiral around a fairly steep hill. I might have been able to make a shortcut up it, but the markers were still bordering the path here, and I had learned my lesson about crossing them. So I walked, the sun directly overhead all the way, around and around, until eventually I came to the top. My mouth dropped open, and I couldn't do anything but stare. It was a stone circle, maybe even the one that long ago Toby found while looking for his son. But honestly, a stone circle doesn't do it justice. Each stone was at least ten stories tall, with some even larger and some laid across the tops of others. There were so many of them, too many to count. The henge might have been the whole world, and every one was covered in the same symbols I'd seen over and over on my way up here. Only here the carvings were so deep I could have climbed inside. On impulse, I kissed my fingers and touched them to the nearest stone. Then I started pacing the edge, always staying outside the circle, trying to get a sense of the scale of the whole thing. I'd walked past four stones when I heard the voice in my head, the one that spoke a language I didn't understand, but which I understood perfectly all the same. Welcome home, beloved, it said. Something was coming towards me from the center of the circle. It was tall, maybe twice my height, with antlers so huge it made it seem even taller. Despite that, and despite the thick covering of mouse-brown fur, it walked on two legs. I couldn't make out more details than that, though. Although it couldn't have been too far away from me, it looked like it was. It was as if the distance inside the circle didn't actually fit the already massive circumference of the thing. I shook my head, and just like that I was angry. I mean, really angry. Angrier than I've been in my life. I yelled at it. Not in the hysterical way I've been doing since I came out here, either. But commanding authoritative, with my back straight and my head held high. You're speaking to the heir of Gwynabnud, King of Anan, and the tall of the Tag, leader of the Wild Hunt. I have the blood of royalty in my veins. My bones were hewn from the mountains, and my soul is poetry and song. I'm a part of my land, and my land is a part of me. And how dare you draw me here and try to make it otherwise? You might have claimed my sister, but you will not have me. Well, I'd like to say all that came to me in a sudden flash of insight. Like maybe Gwyn himself was guiding me or something. Really, I was just channeling Game of Thrones super hard. Well, it didn't matter anyway. The thing just let out a chuckle that shook the stones and said, Ah, we'll see. A cheeky bastard. Wait, it added, as if it knew what I was thinking. Sheer by this point, it's pretty much a certainty that it did know right. Whatever, I've never been one for being told what to do. And just as it came close enough for me to see its eyes, its luminous, fog-gray eyes, I slapped the hand I'd pressed to the stone over my eyes, took a deep breath, and leapt backwards off the hill. There was the echo of a roar in the air around me and my ears popped so hard I screamed. It felt like I was falling for years, I was sure I was a goner. Then I landed on my back so hard it drove all the air out of my chest. I lay there, struggling to catch my breath, and risked to look around. I was back at the little beach Bass had left me on. What the actual fuck? I wheezed, sitting up slowly. I noticed the raven, that same bloody giant raven watching me from the trees, and I yelled up at it. God, are you going to tell me what happened? The raven let out what sounded like a deep laugh before taking off across the lake. 
Yeah, thought not, I muttered. I struggled back to my feet and looked around for any sign of bats, massaging the spot over my right kidney where my water bottle had dug in on the landing. The sun said it was still noon, but there was no sign of him. There was just the bloody kayak and the paddle. I cursed him the whole awful paddle back to shore. Well, actually, I cursed him the whole way back to the cabin, and that's when I started to worry. He was nowhere in sight, and neither was his truck, but the front door was unlocked. I rushed inside, yelling his name, but there was nothing, just silence. I shrugged off the rucksack and went sprinting around the house like a headless chicken, trying to work out what could have happened to him in the last three hours. I'm ashamed to say I was on my third lap of the house before I realized my phone was on the kitchen counter. I switched it on and called his mobile immediately, praying he'd pick up. When I heard that cautious but unmistakably him, Hello? I could have cried with relief. Why did you ditch me on the island, asshole? I said, softening it with a relieved chuckle. He gasped. Anna? Is that really you? Well, yeah, I said, starting to feel slightly creeped out. Bass, where the hell have you gone? You couldn't even wait a few hours for me. Anna, I waited. I stayed there for days waiting. You didn't come back, so I thought, well, I mean, I filed a missing persons report and... God, where were you? I've just been on the island where you left me. Why? How long have I been gone? Where are you now? Well, I'm at the cabin. How long have I been gone, Bax? I'm coming out there to pick you up. Don't move. And with that, he hung up. I had some idea about how long it would take him to get out there, so I went to sit in front of the cold, empty fireplace and just stared into it, wondering what I was going to tell him. What was I going to tell the police, for that matter? Well, I think I nodded off somewhere in there. The next thing I knew, the door had been thrown off its hinges, sliding all the way across the cabin before it fell over. And standing there, in the suddenly open doorway, beaming at me, was my baby sister. I'd finally found Emily. Part 6 Well, it wasn't exactly the touching family reunion I was hoping for, seeing as she'd just kicked the front door across the room. Still, she gave me her usual winning Emily smile, then held her arms out to me for a hug, and I was more than happy to give her one. That was at least until I took three steps towards her and I realised I recognised what she was wearing. It was torn and bloodied and far too big for her. And that's because it was what the guy who tried to shoot me the other night was wearing. She was stood there, smiling just like she always used to, wearing a dead man's clothes. And just like that, I saw her. Really saw her, I mean. Saw the black fingernails two inches long and sharpened to fierce points saw the glow behind the blue of her eyes, saw her teeth. I took one real hard look at her, and in that moment I realized what I should have known all along. She was really gone. Whatever I was looking at might be what's left of her now, but it wasn't my baby sister. M was gone. Her forehead started creasing slightly, her big dopey grin becoming a little strained as she noticed my hesitation. I considered making a break for the back door, but I could hear those yowling voices calling to each other out there, penning me in, leaving me no choice but to go to Emily. I did have a choice, though, and I made it. I'm not saying it was a good choice. I turned and sprinted up the stairs, locking myself in the master bedroom. Then I dragged the dressing table in front of the door, barricading myself in. Emily was barely a second behind me, and the door bounced in its frame as she hid it, yowling. I backed away to the far side of the room, shivering, fully expecting her to start forcing her way through. Instead, she quietly called my name in a perfectly human voice. Let me in, Anne, she said. I just want to talk to you. I just want a hug. Please, I've missed you. I wanted to put my hands over my ears but I had a horrible suspicion I'd keep hearing her anyway. I don't think I could have handled that. 
Instead, I yelled for her to go away, which just made her chuckle. But she came all the way out here to see me, didn't you? There was a teasing tone to her voice, one that said she knew the real reason I was there. Please, I whispered, nearly in tears. Please just let me go home. She paused for so long I thought she might have actually left. Well, that's what you don't get, she said gently. This is home, Anna. It always was. Here, on the island. It's what we were always looking for when we were kids. Every time we climbed a tree, every time we went sliding down a gully to see what was at the bottom, or followed the river, or shone a torch into a hole in the ground, it was all looking for this place. For him. It was in our blood all along. I closed my eyes. <sighs> that was always you, Em. Never me. I only went along with it to keep you safe. Then why not do the same thing now? Come with me, Anna. Come home. I have missed you so much. Please, come on, just let me in. God, it sounded so much like her. So much. But underneath everything she said was a click, 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 which I realized was her nail. She was tapping those wickedly sharp, inky black nails on the door as she spoke, and the thought made me feel sick. When I didn't reply, she sighed heavily, her patented, my big sister is such a nerd, sigh. Fine, you can wait a while. He'll be here before too long, and let's see you say no then. Who'll be here? I said, too loud, panicking. I thought she knew Bass was coming that she was going to force me to kill him or something, like she did with Jim. Turns out it was worse than that, though. Because, of course it was. Him, she said, chuckling. Haven't you noticed the stones? W what? Oh, of course you've been away. Well, have a look out the back. The master bedroom has dual aspect windows. One side faces out over the rear veranda the other over the turning circle out front. I looked out the back, in time to see a cluster of what appeared to be twisted, misshapen deer-cougar hybrids rolling at one of the boundary stones away. I was about to ask Emily how they did it, when I saw it step out from the tree line, contemplating the circle. It raised its eyes to my window, its luminous, fog-gray eyes, and then, slowly, deliberately, it stepped over the boundary. I started screaming. Emily was pounding on the door, yelling that I had to calm down, that everything was going to be okay. And right then, from the front of the cabin, I heard the screech of tires, followed by a car horn blaring. No! Emily shrieked. No, Anna. Don't do this. Just listen to me. I'm sorry, Em, I said. I wasn't sorry. I snagged up the stool that went with the dressing table and hurled it through the front window, even as the chorus of inhuman yowling went up from the back of the house, and from the other side of the bedroom door, which by now was jumping in its frame, starting to splinter. I didn't hesitate. I just went with whatever cliched action movie bullshit was running through my mind at that point. I grabbed the window frame and just straight vaulted through it, not even noticing the shards of glass that embedded themselves in my forearms. All I saw as I flew through was the door smashing open behind me, and the blessed sight of Bass's truck below me. I landed on the porch roof, and from there heard myself into the flatbed, screaming for an utterly bewildered Bass to start driving immediately. He didn't need telling twice. As he hurtled down the road, I opened the window between the cab and the bed and slithered through, landing gracelessly in the passenger seat. What the fuck was that? The big thing with Atlas, coming around from the back of the house. I think he's my new brother-in-law. He didn't answer. Just drove faster. Thank God he knew that road as well as he did. He took every corner practically on two wheels. But he hit them all perfectly. It was like being in a rally car, flying along so fast everything outside was just a blur. No wonder Bass had made it to the cabin sooner than I'd expected. As time went on, though... We both calmed down slightly. 
Not great for me, since the drop in adrenaline meant I was really feeling the glass in my arms. We'd been on the road for over an hour, with no sign of anything untoward, when he allowed himself to ease off the gas, just a little. Ah, uh, we should have known, really. Barely five minutes after, he gave a shaky laugh and told me we were going to make it. I noticed him repeatedly glancing in the rearview mirror. The truck was speeding up again, so fast it started shaking. Something coming up behind us, he said through gritted teeth when I asked. I turned to look behind us, expecting Emily to have commandeered my rental car or something. But instead, I saw him, that furry fucking abomination, sprinting along the road behind us on all fours. He was coming up on us impossibly fast, tongue lolling, foggy eyes fixed on me. I was about to say something, maybe to suggest throwing me out so he could save himself. Especially since even though I'd seen Emily for what she really was now, and even though that had broken most of the spell keeping me there, I still had an awful gut feeling about leaving the place. Before I could get a word out though, Bass screamed and wrenched the wheel so hard I smacked my head on the window. I faced forwards in time to see Cassie, Emily's best friend and Bass's youngest cousin, standing in the middle of the road. I know why Bass swerved, because at first glance she must have looked exactly like she always did. But I knew better. One look at her eyes and I knew better. I tried yanking the steering wheel back to straighten us out, even if it meant running her over. Well, that turned out to be the worst idea of many, because I'm pretty sure that's what rolled us. The next thing I knew, I was upside down in the truck, the seatbelt pressing into what later turned out to be a broken collarbone. I went for the seatbelt release, dumping myself headfirst onto the roof of the cab and sending pain shooting through every inch of me, pain so bad that for a moment I forgot where I was or why I was there. In a pretty rude reminder, the door beside me was literally ripped off its hinges, landing some twenty feet back up the road. I screamed and tried to crawl under Bass to the other door, only for a huge clawed hand, covered in bristly mouse-brown fur, to close around my throat. As it inexorably drew me outside, it started whispering to me. I couldn't make out any specific words, but the overall intention came through clear enough. Come home. Then there was a crack, so loud I had to cover my ears. The hand released me and I heard a horrific scream. The only way I can describe it is if a man and a cougar had fallen off a cliff while fighting and they both realized they were going to die at the same time. A mindless shriek of rage and pain which you heard and felt inside your head at the same time. It faded into the distance and was gone. I lay there for a while, staring up at the floorboards of the truck as a man appeared over me and started demanding to know if we were okay. I smiled at that because I knew I was never going to be okay again. I'd like to go back to Wales now, I said, and then blacked out. The next thing I knew was waking up in hospital, plugged up to every machine going, including my new best friend, the morphine drip. Total tally for my little trip turned out to be a broken arm, ulna and radial, wrist and collarbone, two broken ankles, whiplash, four extremely deep lacerations to my forearms, a bruised larynx, ruptured eardrum, and too many cuts and bruises to count, many of which were infected. They also told me falling off the bank onto my water bottle had traumatized my kidney. Like, no shit, Doc. Rest me too, thanks. Worse than any of that, though, my parents are only a few minutes away now. Bass, who was in better shape than me, came to see me as soon as I was awake. He planted this big, overdramatic kiss on me, in front of the nurses and everything. Scandalous. Then he asked me if I wanted to talk about any of it. I absolutely did not. I did want to know why we were still alive, though. It turns out we crashed close enough to town that the woods were only questionably Tovey land, so there was a bunch of people hanging around with guns, because of course they were. Also, technically, I think they were looking for those dead trespassers. Anyway, they heard the crash and came to investigate, and then shot him right in the side of the head. None of it seemed to slow him down, mind you. All in all, I'm glad I've written this all out, because once I've explained some version of it to the authorities, 
I don't think I'm ever going to mention a word of it to anyone ever again. I'm staying in touch with Bass, though, obviously. Well, I did what I came out here to do anyway. I found out what happened to Emily. I might not entirely understand what happened to her, but at least I know. And by some miracle, I managed to keep it from happening to me, too. Bass keeps telling me how much of a miracle it was that I got out of there, that I got off the island all without succumbing to any of the stuff the other guys did. And I get that, I do. Like I said before, I never expected to make it home at all. So to find myself free, alive, back in the world, and more or less in one piece, it's incredible. I just hope that one day, eventually, the whispering in my head will stop. My dear friends, the first story was really, really popular with you, and um, I did say that if you liked it, I would do the sequel. So there you go. Um, just as good as the first, I think. That sort of brings it all to a resolution, because I don't think there's any more coming. This was a few years since this was written, so it seems to be it. But I really enjoyed that one, and I hope you did too. That is a long one to start the week off. So, having a break tomorrow, but I'll be back again very soon, my dear friends, alright? So I know you'll join me for the next one. Till then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.